Brian here from Control System Lectures. I'm here at the University of Washington to share with you something that I'm really excited about and something that I hope you find interesting as well. We're going to talk about how engineers develop the basic algorithms that allow robotic spacecraft to land safely on other planetary bodies. I mean, just think about that idea. Landing a robot autonomously on another planet. It's just mind-boggling. So we're going to go meet Dr. Mehran Mezbahi, who oversees the RAIN lab, where researchers here are trying to improve the power descent portion of the planetary landing algorithms. Trajectory planning in real time in an autonomous, harsh environment is not trivial. Most of the systems, most of the aerospace systems that I've been involved with, uh, we, we have a very tight computational resources on, on board. Um, we do not want to uh, implement any algorithm that is very sophisticated because we want this system to be autonomous. A lot of times we kind of resort to the simplest type of algorithms and our approach to this is that now that we have so much computational power on board, we should be utilizing them to be able to solve more complex motion planning algorithms like landing. Uh, in real time. Control theory is an important part of this technology, but before we can jump right into learning about the power descent and landing algorithms, we first need to understand some of the basic concepts. Interplanetary spacecraft travel through the solar system along a trajectory that is guided by gravitational forces and onboard thrusters. And this is true whether you're going to the moon or to the far outer reaches of our solar system. And spacecraft can take anywhere from days to get to their destination, or as long as a decade like the recent New Horizons or Rosetta. But once it gets in the vicinity of where it's going, there's basically three different types of approach trajectories. If the spacecraft just wings past it quickly on a hyperbolic orbit and then continues on, it's called a flyby spacecraft. If it fires its thruster and is captured by the gravity of the body and it starts to orbit it, it's called an orbiting spacecraft. And if it intersects the surface of the planetary body, it's called a lander, or an impactor spacecraft, depending on how fast it hits the surface. And it is these landing spacecraft that require precise algorithms to get them down onto the surface safely. Interplanetary spacecraft are zipping through the solar system very quickly, up to 100,000 miles per hour relative to the Sun, and they approach the planet, moon, or asteroid with a bunch of excess speed. It's up to the guidance, navigation, and control system on board to take the spacecraft from the initial altitude above the planet and traveling very fast, down to the surface of the planet to make a soft landing. But soft landing spacecraft, by definition, just need to stop on the surface safely. Remember, they need to avoid becoming an impactor. But they do not land at an exact predetermined target on the surface. That is, they don't care where they land, just that they land. And this is accomplished by solving a powered descent guidance problem. Powered means that you can generate thrust, Descent is that you're going down towards the surface instead of ascending like in launch, and guidance is the part that is figuring out where you're going and how to get there. Power descent guidance is a two-point boundary value problem. You're at a certain altitude and velocity, which is boundary point one, and you want to get to the surface and land safely, which is boundary point two. Whatever you do in between these two points is dependent on the algorithm you choose. Gravity turn is one of the simplest soft landing algorithms, and that's the reason it was used on the first American soft lander, Surveyor, which landed on the moon in 1966. At its heart, the gravity turn algorithm just fires the thruster in the direction of the velocity vector. This accomplishes two things. It kills your horizontal velocity, and as you start to fall towards the surface because of gravity, it straightens you out, causing your spacecraft to end in a vertical attitude which is important because the spacecraft needs to land with its feet down. This is just a really elegant and simple control law if the only thing you really care about is just landing safely. To execute this algorithm, you need to measure the spacecraft velocity with respect to the surface of the planet, and then orient yourself to fire the thruster to oppose that velocity. But there's one more step, because you need to know how much thrust to use. If you use too much thrust, you could end up with zero velocity well above the surface. And if you have too little thrust, well, in both cases, you're now an impactor. So in addition to the controller that's monitoring velocity and adjusting attitude, there is also a second controller that's closing the loop on the velocity you want to be going at a specific altitude. And that is what's adjusting the thrust. Notice that this algorithm doesn't care about the horizontal location of the spacecraft. 
just velocity and altitude. And so there's no way for an algorithm like this to target a specific point on the surface of the planet. But that is the definition of a soft lander. It just needs to get down to the surface safely. Let's see what a soft lander algorithm looks like for something with an atmosphere like Mars. The latest Mars lander, and possibly the most famous, is the Mars Science Laboratory, or MSL, which carried the Curiosity rover. The so-called seven minutes of terror was the period of time that it took for MSL to go from the top of the atmosphere to the surface of Mars. It only took seven minutes, and the way they did it is absolutely amazing. The Martian atmosphere was used to help guide and slow the spacecraft down, first with heat shields, and then with a supersonic parachute. The longer you're on the parachute, the less fuel you need to burn, so it's advantageous to hang onto the parachute as long as possible. Unfortunately, Mars's atmosphere isn't dense enough to allow a lander as heavy as MSL to land under the aid of parachute alone. MSL was slowed only to about 200 miles per hour. Therefore, the entry descent landing team at JPL developed the sky crane, which performed the soft landing function. From this point, we're back to our two-point boundary value problem, just with a lower initial speed, but MSL used polynomial guidance rather than a gravity turn to get to the surface. With polynomial guidance, a polynomial is created that connects the two boundaries, and from this the acceleration and thrust profile is generated that keeps the sky crane following that polynomial. The benefit of this method is that you have better control over fuel consumption, because you can pre-choose a descent trajectory that uses less fuel than gravity turn over the entire range of initial conditions. The seven minutes of terror was a very technical sequence of events, yet polynomial guidance didn't actually end at a predetermined spot. Its sole function was just to find a way to arrest that last 200 miles per hour in a way that doesn't waste fuel. Wherever the end happened to be, that's where it lowered Curiosity down to the ground. That seems strange, right? I mean, the spacecraft just traveled millions of miles and arrived precisely at the planet. Why wouldn't the engineers just give it a little more smarts to fly to an exact spot to land, and thereby avoiding the possibility of maybe a rock being under Curiosity as it's lowered? The answer is, because they didn't have to. The engineers knew that the probability that there was a rock directly below Curiosity as it was lowered was actually really low. To understand why this is the case, we need to understand where landing errors come from and introduce the landing ellipse. The landing ellipse really is just an outline on the surface of the planet where the spacecraft is probably going to land. In fact, a 99.7% chance of landing in it. And the further from the center of the ellipse, the less probable landing there becomes. Now once the spacecraft gets to the planet, Small uncertainties in relative speed and position at the beginning of the descent, and for planets with atmospheres, uncertainties in the atmospheric density, means you actually don't know where your first boundary point is going to be. So the end of the polynomial isn't a single point, but a range of possible landing locations. And all of those possible landing locations is bounded by the landing ellipse. It's like an archery where you're aiming for the bullseye, but unexpected wind gusts can cause the arrow to veer off target in unpredictable ways while it's in the air. If you were to fire a hundred arrows at a target, you might get a pattern that looks like this, densest at the center and sparsest near the edge. When you're a beginner archer, your spread will be large, but as you practice, the spread will get tighter because you learn how to predict how the arrows will fly. Similarly, the more we land spacecraft on planets, the more we learn about its gravity and atmospheric density, and the tighter its landing spread, or the landing ellipse, becomes. Once you know the size of your landing ellipse, the next step is to find a location on the surface where you can place it. The area inside the ellipse needs to have very few obstacles that can get in the way of a successful landing. On Mars, these would be things like rocks and craters and mountains and so on. The larger the ellipse, the more likely there are obstacles in it, and therefore the fewer the potential landing sites overall. Imagine trying to land a spacecraft within a hundred mile circle on Earth, but avoid the oceans, and the mountains, and the valleys, and the forests, and the cities. You could see that you'd be limited to very large, flat regions. Not really the most interesting geographical spots on Earth. Well, that's not exactly true. So far, spacecraft landing missions have been missions to explore completely unknown worlds. And when the entire environment is unknown, even the large flat areas are interesting because they're brand new. 
And the very act of landing gives you more information and more practice landing that will make your next attempt even more accurate. Which opens up more areas where you can land and explore the next time you go back, which then gives you more practice, and so on. But this can only go on so far, because like our arrow example, it doesn't matter how much you practice, you'll never be able to guarantee that every arrow will always hit the exact middle of the target. There's just too much uncertainty in the environment while the arrow is in the air and out of your control. Therefore, you'll always have a non-zero landing ellipse. And remember, that's going to limit the locations where you can land. Of course, if your spacecraft could fly to a target of your choosing within the ellipse, then you'd be guaranteed that you can miss all of the obstacles. And then you could put your landing ellipse anywhere, and the entire surface would be open to you. So to guarantee that you land on a target, you need a spacecraft that is constantly correcting its velocity and its position as it descends. And this is called a pinpoint lander. Pinpoint landers can change their approach to the surface by viewing the landscape, figuring out where it wants to land, and then maneuvering great distances to get there. And this may surprise you, but there has never been a pinpoint landing done on an extraterrestrial body, ever. And that is what today's research is trying to achieve. Pinpoint landing seems easy enough, right? I mean, all you have to do is tell your spacecraft to go to a particular spot, measure where you are at the moment, and then feed that error term into your thrust controller to adjust your position. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. The power descent portion of the landing is a highly nonlinear problem, and even under fairly known environments, very difficult. This is because you can't allow the spacecraft to just pick any path at once. It needs to pick the paths that meet all of the mission constraints, while simultaneously minimizing the amount of fuel it uses. Constraints can include things like making sure that the command window always faces the landing point for human missions, or ensuring that the glide slope isn't too sharp on approach, or don't allow the thruster to be commanded between, say, 20% and 60% of full thrust because it doesn't work well in that region. And once you start adding constraints into your controller, in general, it can become computationally infeasible to solve real time while your spacecraft is descending. Let's hear from Unsik Lee, a researcher at the University of Washington, talking about their approach to solving this problem in real time by formulating the problem a little differently. The pinpoint landing algorithm is very challenging since many constraints are non-convex, which means they are very complex to handle in real-time environment. So the development of onboard pinpoint landing algorithm hinges on how we successfully reformulate such non-convex constraints into computationally tractable ones without losing any critical factors. The very basic idea behind what Unsik is doing is taking all of the constraints and through clever manipulation converting them into something called a convexed constraint. And by doing so makes the constrained power descent guidance problem something that a computer can solve very quickly. And this is going to change the way we land spacecraft on other planetary bodies. Research like this is helping us move away from having to find a location big enough for the landing ellipse to being able to consistently land anywhere where there is a spot large enough for the spacecraft to set down. And pinpoint landing isn't some goal in the distant future. JPL is in the process of testing their guidance for Fuel Optimal Large Divert Algorithm, or GFOLD, which solves the Mars landing power descent guidance problem optimally via constrained real-time convex optimization. Recently, JPL and Mastin Space Systems tested the GFOLD algorithm on Mastin's Zombie Rocket which is the first time such an algorithm has ever been test flown on a rocket successfully. GFOLD works in parallel with the Terrain Relative Navigation Sensor, or TRN, which uses cameras and onboard image processing for horizontal position estimation. And what's really cool about this is that it might fly on the Mars 2020 mission to open up the science targets for Curiosity's successor. These algorithms address landing on planets with low air density. Another great challenge is to land on planets with high air density, like the Earth. SpaceX is demonstrating the ability of pinpoint landing on Earth with their Falcon 9 rocket by landing the first stage booster on a barge after it separates from the upper stage above Earth's atmosphere. This landing is trickier due to the tremendous amount of aerodynamic forces which do not exist on Mars to that extent. So in addition to solving the guidance problem, SpaceX also has difficult feedback control problems too. And they haven't achieved it just yet, but it's through the research, testing, failure, and success of this technology that's going to continue opening up the solar system for planetary science and exploration. It's all very exciting stuff, and you could be a part of the development of these systems. 
I've left links below of some interesting things to read on the topics from the people who have helped me make this video, as well as a few graduate programs and companies that are looking for people who have an interest in powered descent guidance and navigation. If this is the type of work you're interested in, I encourage you to seek out these companies and universities and see how you can help. I would love it if you shared this video so we can increase awareness of planetary science and exploration and to let people know some of the opportunities that are out there. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comment section and I'll try to answer them. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future videos, and thanks for watching.